for this uh, retreat, like at the beginning when I said everything belongs. So all that happened and you've experienced good or bad, what you wanted or haven't wanted is it all belongs. I find this way of reflecting <clears throat> it gives me a, a, a way of, of being, allowing life to be what it is rather than this this uh, kind of conditioned attitude of there's something wrong in it and I've got to make it right. But I find this, if you really look at this this perception of there's something wrong with me or something wrong with you or wrong with the world or the monastery and I've got to make it right and then uh, that very perception uh, means that it increases this this uh, attitude of I am this body these conventions are are real and if they aren't perfect if they aren't just absolutely at their best then there's something wrong and we've got to spend our life trying to make everything perfect or perfect myself and the logic that comes from that then of course is leads to despair because it's like trying to sweep the streets of London clean with a toothbrush you know as soon as you manage to clean up a little bit and go on to the next then it gets dirty again so I mean it's, it's a hopeless task <clears throat> So when we recognize what we perfection is all inclusive rather than than the best. This is a way of reflecting like this this moment is perfect as it is, no matter how you're experiencing it. So if it's, even if you're absolutely miserable in pain and suicidal, then that's perfect for this moment. The, the moment you reflect on it in that way but then you, you've got a perspective on it. You're no longer just kind of absorbed into your misery or the pain or the chaos of the world around you. And so this, this ability to reflect gives us a way of, of letting go of kind of freeing ourselves from the apparent reality that we, that we're, uh, that we tend to uh, regard as as the real world or the real self, real what I really am. Then taking the Buddha's teachings, uh, like just this this recognition of consciousness, that the, this is a conscious realm we're experiencing right now. They're all conscious. Vinyana, so that this consciousness is like this, and and you're you're not trying to to well, you can't kind of uh, you can be aware, you can can acknowledge or recognize consciousness. It's quite empty, you know. It's not like it, but it, uh, the consciousness includes everything. So you're within your field of consciousness at this moment. Everything that there that is present belongs <clears throat> and then then with uh, identifying with the uh, rupa weight in the sanya sankara then we we divide it up it becomes my body and uh, my feelings my memories my thoughts my emotions my opinions, my views, and then that, then that arises in consciousness. But we don't, we, we're not aware of the difference where it's just pure awareness and consciousness. And where there's consciousness that, that is filled with ignorance, avicca. So this is, this is what you can explore, you know. To, to, rec to recognize, to realize this yourself. <clears throat> the consciousness has no 
you know, quality to it other than a kind of, than being conscious. And it's, uh, it's this, it's like this. But then, just by reflecting this way, it's like this. What happens to me? And then I, I kind of open to that. I kind of start kind of in this intuitive sense. I'm not trying to figure it out anymore or find it, but just recognize it. You know, like, like the fish in the water. Is this, if you, the fish who says, what's water like? And, uh, and yet it's surrounding it, going through the fish's body. But it's so, Imminent that uh, we can, you know, we can be aware of that of each other more than of what is really a very strong reality of this present moment is consciousness. Also, to try to define everything, to feel you have to to sum it up with words and poly terms and and uh, definitions in order to feel secure about consciousness. Trust yourself in that like, consciousness is like this. And it's, it's, a, it's a sense of just presence. It's a, it's a, I, I always, it's an intelligent presence. It's not a kind of trance or stupid state, a vacuous state. And then the sense of a self Put yourself into the consciousness now. It's not really, I am this body. I'm 60, I'll be 68 this year. Uh, I'm a man. I'm a Buddhist monk. I'm Ajahn Sumedho. And I'm, and really, you know, uh, bring yourself, you know, your self views, your uh, identities with your body, your feelings, emotions. Make them conscious, but in a way that you, you're observing them. So it's with consciousness with awareness. You're not just operating from ignorance and getting caught in the trap of just going around and around with this in the cycles of your habits. But then you reflect these things, this sense of I'm Ajahn Sumedho, I'm a Buddhist monk, and all that. These things, these are, you know, conventionally what they call conventional reality, but they don't hold. There's nothing that sustains itself in any of this. But when they drop, those perceptions drop, this sense of being conscious is still present. There's still awareness, conscious awareness. And so this is what we call intuitive awareness, or satipanya, satisampatanya. So this, if you cultivate this way, then you can get behind all the all the conditioning of your of your mind. You know, you can you have a you have a you're not just starting from ignorance or subtle forms of ignorance or assumptions, cultural attitudes or things that you know you just you're so. You know, you've never questioned, have never, never seen through it. Like assumptions, like there's something wrong with me. Or they, you pick up when you're a, a child, uh, you know, the first few years of your life from, from parents, from peers and so forth, from ethnic uh, attitudes, assumptions of your class or race and that. They, is consciousness, awareness, consciousness. If you trust it, then you're, then you can get beyond, you can transcend the limitations of any kind of conditioning that you have acquired, whether, you know, through infancy or through education or whatever. Then putting this in the context of the three fetters, first three fetters and stream entry, Sotapanna, you know, like the Sotapanna, or the stream entra, is uh, has seen through these three fetters, no longer taken over, deluded, limited, distorting reality through these three fetters. The uh, Sakaya Ditti, which the personality view. I am my body, 
I am this person, my feelings, my thoughts, my likes, my needs, my dislikes, my faults, and so forth. The whole sense of me and mine can be, that's a created condition. You weren't born with that. That you acquired after you were born and already conscious. <clears throat> so that's very conditioned. That's not, let's say, natural. It's artificial kind of conditioning. So, and it can be any which way. That's why, the, the, you know, the sense of yourself and your self-worth is, is, uh, you know, so valuable from one person to another. Some people got really distorted, you know, really mad perceptions that they, that they believe in and operate from. You see, with people that go crazy and fully committed to madness, to perceptions that they're so bound to, they distort every possible moment through these, uh, through these, uh, uh, perceptions of themselves and the world around them that they're committed to, believe in, but that's not really the way it is. Then Sila Patabaramasa, in that category, put every convention, cultural perception, religious tradition, uh, you know, everything that is, is uh, social attitudes, all your kind of uh, heroes and ideals and and uh, you know things that we really uh, bind ourselves to on the on the uh, conditioned realm, like our cultural background, our our ethnic identity, our religious tradition, uh, our view of Dhamma That can be Sila Patabaramasa also holding to a view about Dhamma and Vinya, or Theravada, Mahayana, uh, or Thai forest tradition, or any of these things. They, not, they, these views aren't wrong. I mean, they're, they're not, not to judge them, but to recognize a view is a view. In a way we hold, we interpret uh, these through, through our the conditioning of our mind rather than through reflecting, through awakening and reflecting on the reality, the real Dhamma. We, we tend to think we understand Dhamma through having acquired knowledge about it, through reading scriptures. Now this is, this is like empowering you to, to trust in your, in this intuitive sense. Rather than in what a book says, or what a teacher says, or, uh, you know, the, where we, we give our, our power away to others all the time. You know, Ajahn Sumedho, you really, you're wise, you know what I need. And that way, you're, you're kind of giving me your burden. You say, tell me what to do. Then, uh, because you, you project onto me a sense that I'm, I'm, wise and you're not. And yet in that very assumption, in that if you trust in your awareness of that, of how we we tend to see ourselves in these very limited ways, I'm, you know, I'm a mess, I'm not very wise, I'm uh, on a conventional level, this is my, my, how, you know, how it seems to us and how we interpret our experience. So this is, we're trusting this innate awakened state, which you can always, you know, if you're willing to to accept the reality of it, you think, I'm not very wise, Ajahn Sumer is very wise, he knows what's good for me. When you really see that as, a, as an assumption you're making or an attitude you have, then you're creating that. That's your own creation, isn't it? That's not the way it is. That's not the reality of this moment that I'm wise and you're not. It, it, that's just what you're creating into this present moment, the assumption you're making. So what is it that's aware of that? 
what is aware of that tendency to assume I'm not wise, you are. Uh, you know, as you explore that, you, can, you begin to see how how much of your life you have have done that, just operating through distortions of yourself, and that's why it is, we we suffer so much because we're always intimidated by others, or you know, we we don't feel you know we always look at others and say, compare them with ourselves, compare ourselves with others, and. Uh, we, we're, you're actually creating these perceptions, aren't we? I think that monk is, is really much better monk than I. I'm creating that view out of ignorance, out of avicca, avicca, bhajaya sankara, sankara bhajaya vinyanang, in the paticca samupar, in the, so, if ignorance is the is the basis, then it affects our conscious reality. How we see, how we experience, what we experience through consciousness is distorted by that avicca. And then it ends up always as sukha parite vatuka tomanasu payasa, grief, sorrow, despair, anguish. So as long as this avicca is your base for operation, your modus operandi, the, the place you, you, you've never gone beyond. You start from ignorance, you meditate, you're starting from a vicha, you know, try and as hard and as, as dedicated and as determined as you are, if you never get beyond that basic ignorance, you know, then you'll be disappointed. You'll have soka paritewa, you'll have Grief and despair as a result. <clears throat> this is a reflection just to co- see how, how the, that the self view in any way always, you know, it's just so unreal and so ephemeral. And yet we assume the reality of it. We're committed to such an such a delusion the, until we start questioning, right? reflecting, is this, is this, what am I doing? What is this all about? And the conventions we use, uh, I, I, like say, I'm from a very idealistic background where you think in terms of how things should be, the ideals of how there should be justice and freedom and love in the world, and evil shouldn't exist, people shouldn't hate each other, uh, and there shouldn't be war and violence, and I shouldn't uh, be selfish, I shouldn't, shouldn't, I should always, you know, I should be a, a man who's fair and just, unselfish, compassionate, Mm. impeccable in conduct and understanding. <laughs> I should be like that. <laughs> so taken, uh, you know, on that level, this is, this is, this is, these are quite beautiful ideals, you know, so. But then, if that's, that's the basic, that's the kind of program that I start from, then, there's always this sense of not being good enough. You know, that's why we, we, so many of us Western people have so much guilt and we're so complicated, emotionally complicated and convoluted because it, it's just a struggle all the time with, with these ideals we have and the, the, and the way we interpret the reality of this moment. So if you, if you know, if you, you should be, I shouldn't be selfish. I should be totally unselfish. And then suddenly I, I have very selfish feelings. But I get confused because, you know, emotionally I'm feeling very selfish. And ideally I think I shouldn't, I shouldn't be selfish. 
And so it's just you feel this. I was judging. I shouldn't. I shouldn't be thinking like this. I shouldn't feel like this. I've got to get rid of these thoughts. I'm really a mess, you know. I'm really got to do something about myself. Get rid of this selfishness. I found, you know, just in my own life, is a was very really idealistic about non-violence. So I was, it was like I was attracted to the Gandhian movement and this attitude of non-violence as an ideal. And so that's such a, a kind of beautiful ideal. Then I, I was uh, very much, you know, that would inspire me. You can get really inspired by it. And then, then I feel, you know, myself sometimes feeling violent, and then just not being able to admit it. You know, just suppressing those feelings. <clears throat> And just trying to to pretend, you know, I wasn't feeling them. There's a kind of well, a defense mechanism. It's kind of words that, where you, you just don't admit it. There's a part of you that cuts off from it because it's it's unacceptable. So then, as I became a Buddhist monk, and this a way of mindfulness. Then I started acknowledging, you know, these violent feelings. And not, not, not putting them in a context of, of judgment, of, you know, I shouldn't have these, or these are bad and I shouldn't have these feelings, but, but admitting them, allowing them to be conscious in this reflective way. Well, not act on it, but, or speak on it, but just recognize it's like this. And not, may, you know, not, not shame myself for, for having emotions that, uh, I, intellectually I despise. Ideally, my ideal, my idealistic mind looks down on and despises. So, and this is, then the, the confusion, the complexity d- falls away, doesn't it? You're not creating a, you're not complicating the moment. No, that's why we, we, we get so confused between the emotional program we, we're stuck with and the, and the maybe the very high-minded, idealistic, uh, view of life that we subscribe to. Like in a monastery, isn't it? This idea of, I want this monastery to be, you know, perfect harmonious sangha. Peaceful, and and I can idealize, you know, a perfect monastic, a perfect Buddhist monastery, where we're all dedicated to the realization of nibbana and all, you know, practicing according to Dhamma Vinaya, and we're all, you know reaching these stages and purifying the mind and and there's harmony and wisdom operating. It's an ideal. And then uh, the reality, that's, that's uh, you know, the ideal's fine. It's, it's, uh, that's the guiding star that's high up. But the reality of here and now is like this. So then... The more we can embrace that reality, allowing it to be what it is, that, 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 I mean, the conditions as they arise in the present, then more and more we actually are moving toward the ideal. But as we, as we, uh, look up at the ideal and p- compare the present with the, the way it is with, with an ideal of how it should be, then we only get confused. We lose our way and we get stuck. So then, Sila Bhattabhamasa is just take that, take the, this, this term, Pali term, and, you know, put, use that for containing all the conventional 
the assumptions that you have and that you're using, you know, the Dhamma Vinaya, the, uh, the conventional Dhamma Vinaya, the, the, uh, Buddhism, uh, the, the, uh, cultural conditioning, the kind of superstitions or, or cultural biases you have, you know, just see these in terms of Sakya Ditti Sila Patapara So this, this covers the, all the conditioned realm really in terms of your own experience of it. You, you know, your own individual experience of, of life in terms of the way you are, the program that you have. Then the, the third fetter uh, is the Wichikicha doubt. Not knowing, uncertainty. And so when you, when you, this is what, when you give up your, your sense of, uh, you know, being a person and being, you know, the, the kind of stability of, of knowing I am this person and I am these conventions, you know, the, the things that we feel that give us, uh, some kind of importance and some stability in this, confusing realm, you know, we, then we, we get very confused, uncertain, being frightened, terrified, because like the world, uh, the world that seems so stable and certain and real for us suddenly is cracked, it's shattered. And some people get very terrified, you know, they're really frightening at first. I remember when, when the security of my world as a youth started shattering, I became very frightened. Then my first reaction was to want to hold on, you know, put it all back together like Humpty Dumpty, you know, try to fit it all the pieces together again. <laughs> but all the king's horses and all the king's men. <laughs> couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again. So, the, the shattered world is, <laughs> got a, that's, you know, that's a, that's a sign, a good sign. But fear and terror, isn't it? That, that all comes into this not knowing. I don't know who I am anymore. I don't know where I'm at. I don't have any, you know, I'm just totally confused. Uh, I don't know what to do next. It's very frightening. And I'm uh, like in the dark, I'm stumbling. And, and all this not knowing, uncertain, darkness. And these are, you know, these are terrifying. We want the light on. We want to have clear directions, guidelines, principles. So many people, you know, find somebody a very strong leader or a strong partner or, uh, you know, uh, dedicate themselves to something, you know, because it's too, too frightening to face the unknown, the uncertain, the mystery, and it's too, for most, most of us it's so overwhelming that it, to give ourselves to something certain, find a, a strong, you know, somebody tell me what to do, it can make me feel all right. So in this way, the, you know, like in terms of being a samana, there is a, the, the, the community holds together, doesn't, we've got the vinaya as a, as an agreement on how we're going to live together and relate to the world around us. And so that is, uh, that's something that, that gives us boundary in terms of action and speech. We need that. And if we don't have any boundary on behavior, you know, it's, uh, it is, it's just, anything goes. You just, you just, like a leaf in a storm. You, nothing holds you down. So in, 
say, making a commitment in the monastic form is like it, it, you're kind of holding yourself down. You're putting yourself in a cage. Tying yourself to the stake is like breaking a wild horse, isn't it? You, you, to break a wild horse, you have to tie it up first till it calms down. But then, if we don't awaken, then we we get we identify the cage uh, with the cage we're in. You know, we're afraid of it. We're afraid to go outside it. We become institutionalized. We become, uh, you know, bound and limited by the convention because we're not reflecting from it. We're merely holding to it, and and we remember. We might have memories of of how frightened we were before we got into the cage, or we tied us, we were tied to the stake. But then the point of, of the, of boundary and limitation is simplification. You know, so you, you're not, you know, you have a, a kind of physical stability, you know, where you're actually committed to something that is, uh, say in a tradition like this, it's, uh, it's not somebody's new idea. It's not a, a new age kind of, uh, fashion. It's not, you know, so we are, we're, we're not here to try to make it, uh, into what we like, you know, trying to, oh, I, I'll become a Theravada and Buddhist monk or nun, but I want to change this and I don't like that and I want to make like this and I don't, and, 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 modify it like that and, and we end up, you know, bending it always to to fit what we think we need and want rather than reflecting on that, using the very frustrations and and inadequacies of the convention we're in for awareness, for awakenness. But then to identify with the convention is still avicca bhajaya sankara. So you become a strongly identified with Theravada, Thai forest tradition, strict Vinaya, and all the rest. Still, you're still stuck with the same, you know, you've maybe improved a bit in terms of the perceptions you're using and You've, you've kind of raised the quality of the condition realm up a little bit, but you but the results still dukkha, because you haven't cracked through the avicca. So recognize you can hold tamavinya with avicca, and you see there's a lot just strong views about things about the, you know what the Buddha taught and so forth, <laughs> and the. Way that that academics or that can endlessly quibble over over things, you know, of, that uh, positions take positions, form opinions. So the the point of the the summer life then is to you know it's a it's an aid, it's a skillful means to see through avicca. And that very act of seeing is vicha, you know, so it's immediate. It's not like you have to take a course in vicha studies. Mm. Or I can tell you what it is and you just, Ajahn Sumedho defines vicha as this and this, and, this. and then you, you've got it, you know. Now this is where you, this is an imminent act of trust. You start from awareness, from the empty still point. Which is uncertain and unknowing, isn't it? It's not, you can't, when your desire mind, you know, it's like, what is it? You know, I can't find it. What's he talking about? If you trust in the awareness of just your own not knowing, confusion, or whatever you're feeling at this moment, it's like this. Whatever I'm feeling at this moment is like this. So that awareness is is embracing, isn't it? It's, but it's not criticizing. 
criticize, you say, I shouldn't feel, if, it's, if you're feeling something you don't like, then you, you add something more to it. I shouldn't feel like this. I don't want to feel like this. But if you begin to trust in the, just, uh, allowing whatever feeling, physical, emotional, whatever, to be the way it is, how do you do that? So then these, uh, this unknowing, vichikita, doubt, uh, these, these three fetters are, you know, they kind of connect with each other very well. It's all about conditions that we're attached to. Thought itself, when you think a lot, you're going to doubt a lot. And so when you try to figure it all out, uh, you'll end up, maybe I've got it wrong. <laughs> uh, so, doubting, which is, is like this, not knowing, feeling confused, uncertain, like this. And so then the, embracing that feeling of not knowing, when many of us have been highly programmed to Resist that, you know, if I don't know something, I've got to find the answer. Right now. So, not knowing also is a way of, of recognizing the world is uncertain. This conditioned realm that we, like this earth, the ground beneath us, and the planet, and the, the, you know, the, the dwellings that we live in. We like to feel they're we like to feel our solidity, like this temple, you know. We built it the last thousand years. The foundations under it, there's tons of cement that this temple sits on. Big oak posts and beams and thick walls and fortress-like. <laughs> and it's, it's, it gives a sense of of, you know, strength and stability. But basically, but actually the, the, this realm is very uncertain and, you know, you can see just how, how, uh, you know, nature always has its way of letting us know, you know, that all our investments in security can easily be just taken away overnight. So your, your strength comes in, in awareness and wisdom rather than in, say, bricks and mortar. Or having everything neatly packaged and spelled out and, and you know, nicely presented and, and affirmed by the authorities and approved of by the only important people and so forth. You know, that sense of yourself as being a worthy person and and being capable and lovable and all that is, 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 you know, that always trying to find that from outside or have certainty, certitude and guarantees. You see, when you get behind that desire and need for that, that very awareness of it, trust in that, so Uncertainty then, doubt, anicca, dukkha, nata. So we're, we're relating to these now through intuitive awareness rather than through definition, through, through, through trying to conceive it and define and, and create a, a, a false certainty through having a nice neat package that we we kind of cling to desperately. So it is scary in, in a, this way, it, you know, emotionally, not knowing, un- uncertainty, taking risks, going into the unknown, the, the dark, the abyss, the black hole, these are frightening images. 
And yet these are the, this is, the more you open to that, to the unknown, the dark, the, the uncertain, the mystery, then you realize nothing to fear. Because the fear comes out of thinking about all that. Oh, I'm afraid of the dark. I, I, I feel, you know, I just feel so, so utterly confused and so, uh, frightened by not knowing things. I mean, I want, I want to have clarity. I want to have guidelines. I want to have certainty. I want to feel safe. I want to feel, you know, that uh, uh, everything's all right. And, uh, and I can't do it myself. I mean, you know, I, I need this from somebody else. I need affirmations. I need uh, physical situations. I need material uh, uh, objects to make me feel safe and secure. As these these kind of fears and doubts arise, you know, the listener, the one who's who's who knows this, is not the same as the fear or the anxiety, is it? You begin to separate the two, discern the difference between the the that sense of I need certainty, I need I need uh, affirmation. I need to know who I am. I need approval. I need safety. To that which is aware of that, which has no name. You can't, you can't, you can only be that. Rest in it. Relax into awareness, into the pure presence. But like in uh, Christianity, people that have this strong sense of the presence of God, isn't that's what they're doing, I assume? Isn't that they have a strong sense or faith in the pure presence of God? That's one way of putting it, isn't it? In in Christian terms, in our tradition, we get we get confused because. This word self gets in the way all the time. Because we're, like in Theravada, there's no self. And we tend to cling to that view of no self, no God, and that kind of, that, those assumptions we make. Now these are only words, you know, these are created perceptions. But in the reality of this moment, you know, you're trusting in the pure presence. You needn't call it anything. It doesn't belong, you know. It doesn't need a name if you just trust it. And to trust it, you have, you, have to, you know, you need to open and feel it, know it, be with it, and be patient because you're not conditioned for that. You're conditioned to become a person, to become your personality. So you get, you know, you get very confused and restless and it seems impossible on a personal level. But this is where I keep encouraging this trust that, that you, in the, this sati sampatanya, now in Christianity, what gets confusing is that God becomes, the perception of God gets in the way also. Because they come, you do, they define it endlessly, they anthropomorphize, they, <coughs> they make it, you know, God into Trinity and, and it becomes so complicated. And you get this patriarchal God and, you know, the kind of <coughs> that you can't help but rebel against when you're a teenager. No, I mean, don't let the words become the, you know, they're, they're just ex- expedient means. They're not ends in themselves. They're not, do you believe, you know, Christians like to ask, do you really believe, do you believe in God? And, and they, you know, as if, what do you mean by that, you know? They assume 
that what their belief is, we all we all either believe or disbelieve. There is an assumption about God, and that assumption hasn't been questioned, hasn't been been you know seen. They merely operate from uh, I believe in God, and then the ass- assumptions you make are from that position. And then, then if you don't believe in it anymore, then you, I don't believe in God. It's a bunch of rubbish. Opiate of the people. <laughs> so, then I'm just reflecting from the, how every convention, you know, in itself is, uh, has its limitations. If we, if we don't use it for awakening and awareness, then we, we get bound into it, limited and and restricted into being, becoming a, some kind of idea, what we think a, a, a good Buddhist should be or a good Christian should be. So, in this, this awakening, and this pure presence is reality to me. It's real. And knowing, it's it's powerful. It sustains itself. It's not created by my desires, by my ideas. So what is it? What do you want to call it? Are well, the unconditions good enough? <laughs> or deathless? Or I can even call it God now. I mean, you know, brought up as a Christian, but that's not a convention that I that I teach through. <laughs> But I have no problems with the words anymore because it's, uh, you know, it's, that's, the words aren't really, you know, where, where we bind ourselves to the words, believe in the words themselves, and, and we're bound is endlessly uh, having to defend our position or reject it. When the advisor says to I am that, or the, you know, there's, they use the, this sense of I am as a, as a kind of focus to get beyond it. I mean, it's, these are, these are using conventions of, uh, that various systems have developed. But the point really is in the awakened reality. So during this, uh, retreat so far, you know. Personally, I didn't want to get sick, and uh, I don't like the, this flu or whatever it is, is uh, most unpleasant uh, physically, and uh, I was hoping this would never happen. <laughs> and uh, that's the way it is, isn't it? It's perfect. Everything belongs. So, uh, you know, this is how we really begin to to flow in our practice, where the practice has a con- continuity. Where if you you see practice in limited terms of sitting on your zafu and and doing very formal techniques, then it's very fragmented. You know, practices in the temple. Uh, but not in the vihara or in, in the kitchen or whatever it is. You know. So then you, you see, you see, you get this idea that the real ones, the, the real practice is when you're sitting in the temple. And, uh, but when you're in the kitchen, that's not, that's not real practice. You just kind of put up with that and do it kind of, kind of as an offering and duty and so forth. So then the, Idea of practice is so fragmented, you know, that you, you, this is what we do with our lives, that everything becomes compartmentalized and the life it always has this kind of sense of being disrupted, no flow to it. So, in terms of, and that's because we, we, we bind ourselves to, we've, we've got these views that, that hold to a certain thing and that, which doesn't fit into that is somehow, you know, we feel threatened or antagonistic or, you know, we don't respect that either. 
where an attitude then of awareness allows the flow, you know, the, the sickness, the snotty nose, the, the hoarse voice, the disruption, the, the disappointment of not getting what I want, and all this, it belongs, rather than thinking of it in terms of, oh, it's disrupted the retreat, and it, and, and, uh, on and on, like, way, one way I, I could, you know, see it as some kind of, see it in very negative terms. Now this, this takes the kind of continuous willingness to, to ex- investigate. You know, so you really, you know, not, I don't mean this to, to make you compulsive about it, but, but this is a sense of trusting. Sometimes we need to, to just let go and hang loose. Because we, we, we grasp these ideals too much and then we get too intensely trying to, you know, where even doing the dishes becomes a, an intense practice of mindfulness. That we, we've got, we've got a fixed view about how we should do it. And, and then we, uh, uh, I mean, we can make that into another kind of obsessive and driven activity rather than a sense of relax, of joyousness, of, of, uh, presence, of being at ease with life, making it, allowing the monastic life to be a life that is, that gives us pleasure, that is, delights us, that we, we love rather than as an intense experience of denial and restriction and limitation and hard work and striving and on and on like that. And I thought, like if, if you're determined to live the monastic life, then how can we live this life so we really enjoy being monks and nuns? And so then our ex- our practice is coming out of the joy of being rather than out of this compulsive need to try to set everything in order, get everything right. And then the devotional side, the bhakti side, becomes more evident in how we relate to each other, the monastery or the world we live in. With like religious communities can be very joyful, or they can be just intensely kind of dedicated towards misery, and to make everything as miserable as possible. <coughs> then any time you feel happy, it's because you've, you know, you feel guilty about it. Mm. If you, you know, if you enjoy your food, oh, you're not a good nun. You should always see your your food as as vomit. <laughs> Make it as horrible as possible. Mm. That's a good nun, isn't it? A good monk, nun. They do that. Mm. But these are ideals, but the uh, from the life is. It's not a denial of beauty or pleasure, but of getting perspective on it. And so like, monastic life is a lot of joy in it. It's, it protect, because it's coming from emptiness, uh, you know, that's its point, is to, not to create an institution, a kind of morbid institution of miserable looking monks and nuns who constantly kind of trying to purify themselves and get rid of their desires. But out of Sangha, of people living in a way that's, that's beautiful and re- worthy of respect, it's a joyful life and has great benefits for both the individual and the society. Because whether you realize or not, this is a, this monastery Amavati is like a gift to this society. And then it's a 
to to Britain, you know, we're living in this country, the gift. And I told the Thais, it's like foreign aid, <laughs> but of the highest quality. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, Americans were giving cruise missiles to Britain a few years ago. <laughs> uh, which, you know, quite impressive weapons, but it's not really of the highest quality, is it, of foreign aid, where this is. So, then the recognize that it does operate on it has so much goodness to it that uh, that it is a it is, I see we're we're helping we our our presence in this country is 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 one of bringing something beautiful something lovely into this society rather than some religious cult that's going to try to convert the society and and kind of make more divisions and more problems for, for Britain. <laughs> I was just reflecting on these, 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 these three fetters and then See, this, this, this path, this awareness is not anything remote, you know, so it's not like stream entry or something is so, such a high attainment that it, and so, uh, so kind of, in, you know, such hard work and you, when you start thinking about it, then it, it becomes complicated and, but it's a, it's learning to trust in something very simple in that which is here and now in a, in awareness and breaking down these these distortions that we're very attached to, not tr rejecting them, not you know, trying to annihilate them, but just see through it, see the way we grasp and hold to condition phenomena, to sakya ditti, to sila uh, patabharamasa, to wichikicca, in which we, we just totally, we confuse ourselves endlessly on the conditioned realm. It just overwhelms us all the time till we can get this perspective on it. 